Bill Mollison. Bill Mollison talked about permaculture as being permanent agriculture and permanent culture. So really it's a celebration of cultures around the world which he studied and witnessed marvelous and amazing agricultural systems as an integrated whole. About 25 years Bill was in the field observing ancient cultures, the Maya, the Inca, the Aborigines and so on. And he took the wisdom of each and he provided a template that all of us could benefit from. I studied under Bill Mollison, the founder of the system. Bill was born in Tasmania, in, in a, quite a, a rural coastal village. Throughout his life, Bill did many different things and worked a number of professions. He worked as a wildland surveyor, he was a biologist, and also a university teacher. And he saw the forest come down, he, he saw the sea starting to be depleted. He saw the resources being lost right way back in the 1970s and he started to get concerned so he realizes that we need to come up with a system that would give us the supplies we need but also give us the solutions that are absolutely essential for permanent sustainable activity for humans to become the most beneficial element on earth, rather than the most damaging system on earth. Bill Mollison conceived the concept of permaculture as a design science and a subject that can be taught with clever little strategies of how it's extended worldwide and how our, our students, once they've taken the course, can teach the course. And, and the word permaculture is owned by the students of the design certificate course, so it's more or less unstoppable. It's a wild system that can't be controlled because it's not centralised. Bill and I worked together teaching his last few courses and um, that was a great honour to work with Bill um, as my teacher and then in the end of his career as his, as his co-teacher. And um, we're good mates. Um, we're good mates. We always have been, we always will be. In Australia, there's a man named Bill Mollison who got so pissed off at environmental destruction that he developed a way to design sustainable systems in every inhabited region on Earth. What was or is your motivation for practicing permaculture? Uh, well, it's very simple. Uh, it's anger and actually fury. fury I have no other motivation. Fury about? Uh, the senseless destruction uh, that we're visiting on the earth and, and the way people in poverty and hunger are treated uh, the monetary system and its ignorance uh, and just generally the fact that we could do so much better and we don't we just ignore what's happening and so I'm very angry I gave a lecture in Bristol to some 700 Englishmen and women and I just come up with Botswana and Botswana is is or was a British protectorate called Bechuana land until in 67 it got its independence. And the English signed all sorts of deals with it. It, it was going to buy, it buys, a quarter of a million beef carcasses a year off Botswana. And Botswana has this nice 20 year drought cycle. Drought, 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 drought. And it's had it forever. Uh, we traced it back, you know, 16 cycles. So, okay, and these, this is the excessive rain years. Quarter million cattle, they, they run about a million and a half cattle. Selling off a quarter of a million here is good business. But down here, they have a job to have that quarter of a million. 
and they're not in very good nick. So England signed this contract and so did Botswana. Everybody's rubbing their hands, good deal. And England built the abattoirs at Francistown, a couple of other places, and, and washed the cattle down so thoroughly that they used 80% of all the water available in Botswana. Yeah. And the other thing they did is, is really horrifying. They put, uh, little Botswana sits here somewhere, and this is the Kalahari, and it's huge migrations of game backwards and forwards uh, from the uh, high rainfall into the Kalahari and out again. And somebody in England, I, I'd like to find this monster, track him down and have him hung publicly, he, uh, he said, we can't let these wild animals range through the farms where we're buying cattle. They might carry some infectious disease that our cattle will catch. That the cattle had never have done so, but he supposes they might have. What we must do is build fences across Botswana that totally prevent migration of wild animals. Bang, bang, bang. The cordon fences. The first ones they closed are uh, 60 or 80,000 GNU piled up against it and died. Following uh, and the zebras, these animals can't jump. Most long, long range migrating animals are not jumpers. They can run but they don't jump. And so they didn't jump the fences, they just piled up against them and died. And, and the same with the, the little uh, Thompson gazelle and all, all the other animals. Now following these herds were lions, lots of lions, uh, hundreds, probably thousands of lions. So for a few days, they had a big party on the fences, eating the... But they don't eat really rotten meat. And after that, they were very hungry. And for the first time in the history of the Kalahari, they turned on people. Uh, so you had hungry lions chasing and eating people and, and stalking and, and uh, hunk, hunting people. And uh, a few of my friends, like Huso and Horotzi, who are Bushmen, and, and many of the Bushmen that I took for classes, said it was hell. The lions had never attacked them. They could walk past their noses and they talked to them politely every day. And then suddenly the lions were eating them and coming and getting them at night. And Husa was nine and Horatsi was 11. And they ran for it. And every night they spent in thorn trees. Not very comfortable because leopards could still get them up there. But they got out of the Kalahari and survived. But none of their bands survived. All 30 or 40 of their fellow tribesmen and women died. Our lions hate them. So this guy's sitting back in Europe, probably in England, sharpening his pencil. His bloody uh, cordon fences are in place. He's killed out thousands of tons of game. And he's killed out a lot of people, hundreds of people in the central Kalahari. And you can see the bones still today, it's just a mess. I tell you, fury drives me. Fury will continue to drive me. And that's the sort of thing that makes me totally furious. Yeah. Are the fences down now? No. Yeah. So, England takes their quarter of a million cattle every year. Now think about that. Do you think England has a shortage of cattle? Do you think Europe has a shortage of cattle? No, it has a beef mountain, doesn't it? It can't get rid of its bloody beef. So 
So what do you think happens to the Botswana beef when washed down with 80% of the water in Botswana, it arrives in England? No, you surely could use it for something. Dogs. And if you look on, the, on TV, you've got some bloody tin of beef or something, and you've got some little fox terrier or some revolting little dog. He's there wagging his tongue, got his tongue out. <laughs> you know, real chunky beef. So he gets a lot of TV time, that dog, and he gets a lot of beef. Back in Botswana, nobody can any longer afford meat. Nobody. Even at the wholesale price of really fresh washed beef. The kids are dying. Little swollen bellies, for core, and uh, they are dying. Uh, this is called... Uh, what's it called? Yeah. Rational. Genocide. Yeah, no, it, it, unfortunately, not called genocide. But I get up in Bristol and I'm calling it genocide. And I said, I've got a better idea for you guys. And somebody, nobody said, what is it? Because they didn't want to know. I said, what you do is, you go to Botswana and put in a mercy killing station for children there and you can the kids because it's much better for them to be shot than die slowly of starvation and your dogs still get fed. <laughs> or you go on as you are, go right ahead and kill a kid every day. Keep your dogs. So they went right ahead and kept their bloody dogs. And I don't give a frig about kids dying in Botswana, or anything else dying in Botswana. <coughs> Just so long as they got the Humane Society for Dogs. For dogs. See, this is how you get furious, absolutely furious. Um, hmm. So, because that's what's happening in agriculture, that's what's happening in politics, it's what's happening. You're not going to stop it. The dog gets too much television. The child gets no television. You don't get a kid getting any television and you don't get a kid getting any beef either. I've got a little uh, poster I didn't bring any with me. It says, save whales. Eat a dog every day. <laughs> That'll do, you can say, save kids, eat a dog a day, save Botswana, eat an Englishman occasionally. <laughs> Have you ever had 700 angry Englishmen trying to get them to stage with you? Um, they're quite scary when they do their blocks. But certainly you won't part them from their dogs and you won't part the dogs from the meat. I don't know why I told you all this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Agricultural policy has some very uh, obscene results if you follow the thing through. Mollison was concerned that conventional agriculture erodes soils and relies heavily on external fertilizers and biocides. Bill says we have to get our houses and our gardens in order working for us or we're just going to have to continue to lay waste to all natural systems to sustain us because the system, the design we're in right now, what we do, it's just not sustainable. Basically, about 4% of us keep all the rest of us running. All essential services are covered by 4% of humanity. That's stretching it a little, probably 3%. It's not really an essential service to get a massage. Um, 
So all your food can be produced, all your energy systems maintained by a very small number of people in your community. Or you can rotate through that functions. We'll give examples later where to earn your income for the year costs you at least five days a month. We'll be, talk be talking about those systems. So most of the time, people are going to work, nine to five sort of work. <coughs> They're not doing a damn thing, really. Just make work. And my school teachers know they're running a vast babysitting system. That's all they're doing. Holding hands. Yeah. Can little bits of paper one to the other. <laughs> Trying to make it look important because you've got to supposedly work an eight hour day or a nine hour day for a five or a six day week. So you've got to appear to be busy. If you didn't have to appear to be busy, you could go home most days. Um, so most of us are out there trying to look as though we're busy and, and on it, honestly what we do most of the time is make work, make inessential work. But, but that means that only 2% of us gardening at any one time can easily feed all of us and it's a trivial exercise, it's not difficult at all. It would take you about half an hour to teach somebody to plant how, how to plant six months' food. It takes them 40 minutes to plant it. See how long it takes you to go down to Walmart and come back. <laughs> so in the same time it takes you to go and shovel Walmart, you could have planted six months' food and never go back to Walmart again. So it's trivial. It's a trivial exercise to design energy efficient housing. There's so much of it now, it works so well, it's really trivial. We're not talking about things which are intellectually difficult or physically difficult to do. And if you've got your gardening over with between, say, the ages of 18 and 20, and spend an extra day and cut yourself a house, or made enough bricks to build that house, and that take one day for a two story house you more or less finished work as far as housing and food goes. And if your house is energy efficient, you'll finish work there. So then you think, what can I really, what did I really want to do with my life? <laughs> Certainly it wasn't sit in some, some oversized car crate, uh, paying it off your whole life. Is that what you wanted to do with your life? No, you know, you can't imagine possibly what it is you would like to do with your life. Certainly uh, not paying off rubbish. It's rather amusing to think about a house. You know, your great-grandfather builds a solid brick house and uh, he dies. You decide, you know, as his aid of you, you'll sell the house and take the money, so you do. Then someone comes along and they have to buy the house. Meanwhile, it's going to cost them more than what it cost your great-grandfather because uh, it cost him very little. <coughs> so he, he, they charge double for it, so they pay for it double again. But what they're getting is exactly the same house and it's slightly deteriorated. And then it goes on sale after sale after sale. If you talk to land agents, they'll point to houses which they personally have sold eight or nine times. And every time it costs more and more and more. And those houses which start off at $9,000 in Grandpa's day get up to a quarter of a million dollars. Same old house, been paid for a lot of time. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, you know, you have to draw back from it all and think about it because why in the hell would you ever pay for anything again? Your, your great grandfather paid for it. You, you don't have to pay for it. But if you want to go on paying and paying and paying and increasing the amount you pay, you spend your whole generations of people spend their whole lives paying for things which were paid for when they were built. Except in some cultures they don't. 
like, you know, just back from Austria, people live in the houses their great-grandfather's built. You know, they don't pay any, a penny for that house. You're just born into the thing. You know, there's 20 or 30 of the family live there. They've always lived there the last 5,000 years. The house doesn't cost you anything. Your job doesn't cost you anything. It's all there. And it's about all to end. Uh, so we had it right. You didn't waste your life paying for something which took, you know, less than a year. My grandfather built a house for a bet in two days. And it's still standing. For a bet? For a bet. <laughs> yeah. It took me a week. <laughs> Old fellows are pretty cluey. Um, Now, when you look at a whole system, there are two things very undesirable in the system. One is work and the other one is pollution. But as soon as you see work, you will get pollution. Pollution is a product of work. Work is a result of not supplying any com every component of your system with its needs. You know, let's put that in way. If you didn't put a tank on your chicken house, you've got to carry water to the chickens. So you incur work when you've not designed a way in which the components of your system can attend to their own needs. Now, if you don't collect the eggs from the chicken house, that's pollution. So pollution is an unused resource. It didn't go somewhere where it would be used. So, but if you collect the eggs, they're no longer a pollutant, they are a resource. And so it goes. So work and pollution are both faulty design symptoms. So, that, that will lead us later to methodologies of design. Again, design has not been defined by people, we've defined it here. We design for functional relationships in whole systems that will save energy. Uh, if we fail in design, we'll incur work and we will certainly incur pollution. Permaculture mimics ecosystems, reducing the need for inputs, and it avoids synthetic fertilizers and biocides. And permaculture is used for more than just agriculture. For instance, it's also used to design sustainable buildings. Permaculture is an ecological design science that seeks to mimic nature in the way that we design food systems. We've got some pretty serious problems when it comes to agriculture. We're losing a massive amount of topsoil from our industrial farm systems. And what happens is that topsoil runs away into our rivers, lakes, and streams and creates all kinds of issues with algae blooms, uh, water pollution issues, and things like that. And really what permaculture seeks to do is mimic nature's brilliance that we would find in a forest. And we know that a forest produces no waste. There's no such thing as garbage in nature. So we can mimic that when we design what we call permaculture food forests or perennial polycultures. And a perennial polyculture means lots of different trees, lots of different bushes working together um, in a closed loop system where the output of one plant becomes the input of another. And when we design these systems, what we're finding is that these types of agricultural implementations take far less water, take far less fossil fuels. And what we're seeing after a couple of studies done on small-scale, organic, biodiverse farms is they actually outproduce traditional agriculture, calorie for calorie. So we're seeing a lot of examples emerging of farmers that are embracing this agroecology, combining agriculture and ecology, uh, with a far less footprint, far less fossil fuels, far less water. 
and the food is actually healthier. The food is actually a lot more nutrient dense. So we're seeing some very viable solutions emerge with permaculture and it's all based on mimicking nature. Hi, Jeff Lawton here. And this is a very sad time because Bill Mollison, the father of permaculture, and my teacher, my good mate, mentor, and, and in the last few courses that Bill taught, my co-teacher, Bill's passed on. And he's left us with an incredible legacy, the permaculture design system, which is really a, a revolution. I, I believe it's an evolution. It's an evolution of human thinking. It's the way we can turn things around. We can be the most beneficial, the most productive, but environmentally recreative. We can be the element that repairs the earth while we supply our own needs. And this is what Bill's left us with. And this, this is the turning point. This is the point when we need to make a decision. Are we going to do this? Are we going to use this incredible design science that begins with ethics? This ethical design science. Are we going to use this to repair the earth? So it can go, go on indefinitely for the future generations. We have the capability to create such an abundant living system. A system that's presently unimaginable. Or are we, are we going to carry on in this destructive mode? Not really caring that our actions are going to create a situation we really don't want to really understand. I think this is the time when all caring, thinking people need to jump on the team of permaculture and, and, and get this done. We don't need any permission. It's always been, as Bill called it, peaceful sedition. You don't need authority. We can do this for ourselves. No one's going to come along and do it for us anyway. It looks, it looks like we are going to have to do it for ourselves. And we can. We can turn all the principles into directives to act. And that's what Bill wanted. Bill always used to say, doesn't no matter how much information you have, information that is not acted on is useless. We need to take action. We need to go into action. Many of the people in permaculture have contacted me and said we feel more committed now we've got to get this done so let's do it let's get on with it let's fix the world let's create that abundance that we know is possible even though we can't even imagine it let's do it for ourselves let's do it for our families let's do it for our community and let's do it for the future generations the children of the world deserve it so i just found out that bill mollison passed away last night peacefully in tasmania and uh, it's very sad news, obviously, because of how much good this man's done to humanity and the world. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, I want to make this video to honour him and to uh, encourage you all to study permaculture. Because it's the... It really is the true solution. Practical answers that everyone can take right now to manifest the greatest life ever. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank Bill Molson for all the uh, hope he's provided me. And all the knowledge he's provided me. What are we doing, everyone? It's disgusting the way we are living. Slavery, violence, and environmental destruction.
We need to think and act our way out of this madness. And that's what permaculture is about. Thinking and acting our way out of this insanity. So thank you, Bill, for everything you've done. For me, in my life personally, and for so many others. We won't let you down, man. I will continue to dedicate my life to promoting permaculture as the foundation for everything we want our lives to be. Many thanks, much love, and much encouragement. Thank you. Designer, you're now a recliner. So long and thanks for the yield. And your tools left behind have all sharpened our minds To keep growing the change in the field The future is looking quite shady Under all the ideas that you've grown And to look out the window at food in the ground Gives us power to face the unknown But trees eat us all in the end so plant one for me when I'm gone Then if you hear that I've died You can tell them they've lied I'm just shading out somebody's lawn Tapping into the rhizomes of wisdom You wove them all into a tale and with seeds in your pockets and dirt on your hands He took us into the belly of the whale He took us into the belly of the whale So go on and tell us another Cause your stories are food for the soul Helping us to see the forest for the trees And ourselves as a part of the whole See ourselves as a part of the whole Yeah, trees eat us all in the end So plant one for me when I'm gone Then if you hear that I've died You can tell them they've lied I'm just shading out somebody's lawn Come to us with ease Take care of the land Your friends and your family And remember to plant lots of trees Cause trees eat us all in the end So plant one for me when I'm gone Then if you hear that I've died You can tell them they've lied I'm just shading out somebody's lawn Tell them they've lied, I'm just shading out somebody's lawn. <laughs>